Lesson 29. Last week we introduced the concept of pratyahara or detachment and the importance of it. We're going to have a look at some um, more details. There are four particular approaches to pratyahara, starting with yatamana pratyahara, which translates as progressive detachment. That is something that you do gradually, consciously. Um, applies especially to situations where you are attached to uh, the past, uh, people in the past, neighborhood, school that you attended. But also, um, when a loved one dies, you go to the cemetery, you miss that person a lot, makes you very emotional. <clears throat> in the beginning, you want to be there as much as possible, as often as possible. So you go there maybe every weekend. If you find yourself unable to move on with your life, being too much uh, attached still, you need to consciously start gradually taking more distance. And practically that means that you, um, in case of, of, of a loved one having passed away and, and um, uh, going to the cemetery on a regular basis, instead of going every week, you consciously decide to go every two weeks for a while. Then, having done that for a while, you decide to go once a month, and you increase that, uh, the interval between visits very consciously and deliberately in order to allow yourself to detach, to enable yourself to move on with your life. It's all about control and consciousness and making deliberate choices in this sense. Why is this important? Because staying stuck in the past, staying stuck in uh, things that don't exist anymore, people, situations, keep us from uh, being in the present and living life, moving on with our lives and doing meaning of meaningful things in our lives. And some extreme example of um, people staying stuck in, in the past um, it can be a very negative experience, like a war. I, I usually mention the example, and I think I mentioned it before in this class as well. Um, when I went to southern France on vacations during the summer um, in, the, in the 1980s and 1990s, you inevitably end up in, um, in those village squares, the, the, the center of town where you have a bar, which is the center of the town. You buy newspapers there, you buy uh, tobacco, cigarettes, uh, of course, it's a bar. You go there for breakfast, uh, lunch, dinner, and drinks. The town gathers there, the town meets there, and tourists, of course, also uh, go to those places. Inevitably, around that time, there were still those generations that survived the Second World War. Southern France, or France, was occupied by the, by the Germans. And, um, Inevitably, you would come across people that, that would want to talk with you. Um, and they had one story, which was about the war and their, and their, um, their horrible experience uh, uh, with, the, with the occupiers, the way they were treated. Um, slave labor, uh, mistreatment, torture, etc. And every day that you came there, the same person, would tell the same story. They just, 
that was the only story that they knew. And the, the sad thing about it is that those people are still stuck in that experience 40 years ago at that time, 40, 45 years ago. And they haven't really been functional ever since then. Stuck in their traumatic experience, they haven't been able to have a family, they haven't been able to have a meaningful career. All they had was their misery, their, their, their pain, their sadness. Which is normal, it is uh, uh, natural, it is human, but you get stuck, you stay stuck, and you, st you drown every day and every moment of the day in, in that misery that is not taking place anymore in the present. <coughs> so people who, people who are able to move on with their lives, we have a very deliberate way of approaching it, but there are also people who do this naturally, spontaneously. People who are able to move on with their lives ever actually do something special. They use their negative experience and turn it into something positive. It usually influences uh, the projects that they undertake, the, the passion that they have for, for doing something meaning, meaningful for the, for the community, for society. Um, uh, they, they turn their misery into something positive. And that is the whole purpose also of, of Pratyahara, is that you, um, you stop drowning yourself in your misery. It's not that it's, it's unacceptable or, or you know, not normal. It is normal, it is natural, it is human, but it just, it just, it's destructive. Um, so, we need to, we need to if, if we find ourselves being stuck, we need to take control, we need to take the reins and uh, take deliberate steps to be able to move forward. A little bit less tragic is a, a situation that I see with, uh, with many people. Um, uh, I, ha I, I come from a big uh, family and uh, my, my youngest two siblings, they are twins. They, um, they're both girls. Because they're twins, they've always had a lot of attention since they were born. Um, but beside that, they are blonde and they have blue eyes, so always had a lot of attention. Um, so they were very popular in school, and they're part of a huge uh, high school group that still, 40 years later, still gathers. Um, they're very tight-knit. They do everything together, they go to concerts together, they, uh, they watch videos together, these days Netflix and what have you. Um, and and, and they, still, they still live that, that, that life uh, that they did as teenagers. Uh, the same interests, the same talk, the same jokes. Uh, not, nothing wrong with that, except for the fact that they've never really um, manifested as their true selves there's still that element or that part of that, um, of that group, of that, of that uh, um, um, social, uh, social uh, uh, group. Um, another example is, uh, uh, be, I came to Korea because I was interested in martial arts. I ended up in a Hapkido gym in Amsterdam and uh, five years ago, uh, uh, my Hapkido buddies came to visit me and our Hapkido teacher, who is now also uh, in Korea. Um, and, and that's all they do. They, they're constantly talking about uh, um, uh, Hapkido. They're still obsessed. They're still... Um, I have moved on. I'm totally not interested anymore. Uh, I've seen the essence of it all and... and, and at that time, it was, it was um, functional, it was necessary, it was, but it was just a stage. And for them, they're st still stuck in that experience 40 years ago. I have a photo where we are somewhere in the countryside uh, with our Hapkido teacher, and we're all sitting there, and it's just like as if you're looking at a scene from a, from a cheap uh, Hong Kong uh, movie uh, that, that in the 70s and 80s were produced by Raymond Chow 
first with uh, Bruce Lee, later with uh, with other uh, uh, kung fu uh, stars, and 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 they they still identify with that. It's, it's cute, in a way, and again, nothing wrong with it. But they haven't moved on. They're still, 40 years later, it's all they can talk about and think about, and it's dominating their lives. That is why prachahara is important. And when you feel that you're stuck in the past, uh, I mean, melancholy, um, reminiscing the good old days, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you feel that you stay stuck in it and it becomes an obstacle, you need to constantly redirect your attention to, to, to the present. The moment that you're conscious of the, uh, uh, the attachment, the, the fact that you are just um, <coughs> um, drowning yourself in, in, in those uh, sentiments, um, you need to consciously decide to withdraw your attention from that thought, that feel, it's a feeling really, an emotion, and, and redirect it to uh, something in the present, a book, a study, um, a, a relationship, or, or anything that, uh, that, that is taking place in the here and now. <coughs> the second form of prachahara is called fiatireka prachahara. <coughs> it's something that you do if the first one doesn't work. Fiatireka prachahara means exclusive detachment. Here, you're going to focus exclusively on the issue that is uh, holding you back. And uh, 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 a clearest example of this is dealing with addictions. And before I ever learned about, uh, I started practicing yoga with, without the study that, that I started doing a couple of years later when I found Ajita, my, my teacher. Um, but just intuitively or instinctively, after I started practicing yoga, many changes took place. I became interested in nutrition. I became interested in, uh, in uh, well-being, very naturally. And one thing, I, I smoked at that time. And <clears throat> I just very naturally felt the urge to stop smoking, only to discover that that is very, very difficult. And you learn from other people also. Many people try to stop and almost always fail. What I did intuitively was I started to find information about smoking. I started to gather um, information about all the harmful aspects of smoking. And I would write them down on an A4 sized piece of paper and put it on the wall in front of my desk, where every time I sit at my desk, I would see. And in the end, there were like 40 pieces of paper there covering large part of the wall, making me realize that there are so many negative aspects about smoking and hardly hardly any good, that it becomes like a mantra that you're constantly repeating to yourself. Smoking is bad. And when you are soaking up all that negativity about smoking, it becomes very natural that you want to stop. Not because other people tell you or the doctor orders you because your health is deteriorating, but just because you realize that it's foolish to continue doing something that is so harmful. Has that has so many negative uh, uh, repercussions on, 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 on your health, physically, mentally, etc. And besides that also, my, my, at that time I was still in my early 20s, my dad died from lung cancer, and later other people died from lung cancer, smokers, chain smokers. So it's only natural that you want to stop, but you realize that it's very difficult, so you need to very, very, um, uh, conscious approach, soaking, soaking up all the negative aspects of, of um, the activity you're engaging in, um, making it very uh, obvious that that is not uh, a good thing to, to continue with that kind of behavior. 
And what I did as a result of that, because I couldn't stop smoking uh, just like that in one time, I started to play with it. Normally, somebody who is addicted to smoking, the first thing that they do when they wake up in the morning before doing anything else, they light a cigarette, smoke. So what I did is I started to postpone the first cigarette. I started to postpone the first cigarette to after breakfast. And having done that, I then postponed it to after or around coffee time, 10 o'clock. Then I postponed it to after lunch, because after a meal, smokers always want to smoke. And then I postponed it to tea time, 4 o'clock. And in the end, I ended up with only one smoke in the evening. And then very naturally, without any effort or struggle, I was done with it. That is the, the, um, the exclusive detachment approach where you take the issue that you're dealing with exclusively focusing on it, uh, uh, making yourself very aware, very conscious of why it is that it is bad for you. And it doesn't only apply to, to substance abuse, uh, uh, smoking, alcohol, drugs, and what have you. It can apply just as well to relationships or because relationships can also be toxic or harmful and yet we find it difficult um, to get away from it. So, um, writing down really helps. If you write down your thoughts about the reasons why you need to quit certain behaviors, um, really helps to, 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 to bring it to the service of your consciousness making it, um, in the end, making it uh, more natural and easier to, to break that cycle and, and quit with that kind of behavior. The third level of Pratyahara is applied when the first and the second don't work. It's a little bit uh, scientific and, and, and um, well, it works as follows. The, the chakras are all related to uh, um, uh, our senses, the gross senses. So especially Muladhara chakra is related to smell, which um, smell and taste uh, are in the lower two chakras. And most of the things that we're dealing with are related to smell and taste. Um, I started smoking as, as, as a kid already because everybody was smoking, all adults were smoking. My parents were smoking. When there were visitors, the house was full of smoke. It was just a blue, gray, blue smoke uh, uh, floating uh, through the house while the kids were uh, playing on the floor. Something that is unthinkable these days it was very normal at that time. Um, I, I love the smell of people smoking. I love the. Uh, um, the, the atmosphere that came with it. So as a child, you want to try it too. The taste is totally different when you smoke yourself. The, the smell is very different when you smoke yourself compared to when you're in a room where people smoke. But you're curious as a child and, and you copy that kind of behavior. Um, smell and taste um, are very powerful uh, uh, elements that make us attracted to uh, smoking, certain kinds of uh, uh, drugs and alcohol, but also food. Lots of people struggle with food. They find it difficult to, um, to eat healthy, nutritious foods and, and end up eating uh, things that taste good, that, that uh, uh, um, uh, satisfies their, uh, satisfy, uh, the, uh, their great craving but actually harmful because of the huge amounts of salt, sugar, fat, hydrogenated fat, bad fats, unhealthy fats, etc. And very little uh, uh, nutrition to, to, um, to add. But that's the world that we live in. If you go to the supermarket, 
you see that 80% uh, of all the foods in the, in the, on the food shelves is basically uh, um, in that category of super processed foods. And it's, um, it's what uh, people put in their baskets. <coughs> so um, the approach here uh, is that uh, uh, you have to determine which of the senses it is that um, makes you feel strongly attracted to the harmful uh, uh, behavior, and then try to divert attention from, uh, from the smell, in case it is smell. Or divert the attention from the taste. Uh, try to divert your attention to something that is not related to it. <coughs> you see an, uh, an uh, illustration of um, a cowboy leaning against the wall, smoking a cigarette. That's the infamous Marlboro Man. The Marlboro Man was an image that, in the past, long before the internet, if you wanted to see a movie, you would, you would go to a cinema. Before the movie started, there were always um, um, commercials. And one of the most famous commercials that you always got before the movie was the Marlboro uh, 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 commercial where you had the Marlboro Man sitting on a white horse uh, looking over the prairie with a cigarette. And sadly, this man died from lung cancer. Um, but, but it's an image that many people um, identified with. And it's the reason why Marlboro, I don't know about these days, but Marlboro was the most uh, uh, famous brand, the most uh, popular brand, um, as a result of that image. So you have, you have a, a smell in the in Muladhara chakra, you have taste in uh, Svadhisthana chakra. But what many people don't realize is how much the visual aspect, uh, which is uh, Manipura chakra, is, is also causing us to, um, to want to... We, we want to uh, be part of that experience, the, 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 the rough and toughness of the Marlboro cowboy or the glamour the glamour of the, you had other uh, cigarette brands, Stuyvesant, uh, Belinda, that, that was appealing to um, uh, globe, globe trotting. It was, it was identifying with uh, uh, air travel, which these days is much more common, of course, but at that time was glamorous for the rich. Um, and and it, it made people want to have these brands, consume these brands. So it's official aspects also very, um, very powerful tool in the marketing industry, probably the most powerful, more powerful than, than taste and, and smell, actually. Simply being aware of that, how it works, and then taking control, diverting our uh, attention to, to other um, more constructive activities uh, in, the, in, in the long term will help us to detach from these kind of um, habits. The last one is the one I like the most. It's um, creative and playful approach where first and foremost, you allow yourself to just be human. That you do not uh, punish yourself or feel guilty about your behaviors but that you start to play with, uh, uh, with your weaknesses and, and, um, and play also with the idea that you want to take a handle on it, that you want to take control of it. It applies especially to um, uh, drinking and eating, but it can also apply to people. If you, if you have a, a, you know, in, in French you have this concept of femme, femme fatale, you feel attracted to a person romantically, erotically, but you know in your heart that that person is not good for you, that that person is, is uh, uh, leading you to do things that, uh, that you later regret or, or um, you just know that that's not good for you, but you can't resist. Um, what I always use, as an example here is the typical Dutch situation where um, if you wake up early in the morning and you go to work, um, you walk through the streets 
and there's the smell of freshly baked bread because there are, there are at least in the past, I don't know these days if there are still these uh, traditional bakeries, but in the past uh, there were traditional bakeries uh, everywhere. Every street, uh, every neighborhood had their own traditional bakeries, which, which means the, 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 the baker comes around one, two o'clock at night, starts kneading the doughs, and around five o'clock all the bread and, and, and pastries come out of the oven. And the smell of that is just so irresistible. It's very difficult not to um, give in. And it is, of course, they have a very clever approach, those bakeries. Uh, the healthy breads come out of the oven first, then they start with the pastries, which smell even better than the fresh, freshly baked healthy loaves of bread. And when you go into the bakery shop, the loaves of bread are stacked on shelves behind the personnel, but all the um, all the the, the not so <coughs> the not so healthy uh, products, <coughs> all the pastries and the cakes and what have you, are all in the shop window in front of you. So while you are ordering your bread, it is very tempting <coughs> to bring home a couple of these delicious. Uh, 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 pastries with lots of, lots of uh, whipped cream and, 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 and what have you. Same with a snack bar. D Dutch snack bars are very typical. They, um, most of the food in the Dutch snack bar is, um, is deep fried and there's a huge variety of, of um, deep fried uh, foods um, which produce a very, very tempting, delicious smell. So if you live in a street where there, <coughs> where there is a snack bar, <coughs> it's very difficult not to be drawn inside and order um, some snacks. One of the staple foods in the snack bar is french fries with mayonnaise or, or peanut sauce or a mix, um, which also produces a, a very tempting smell. But then you have all these different kinds of snacks, croquettes and what have you. Um, it's just uh, very difficult to resist. This last fashikara uh, prachahara, uh, we call controlled prachahara, means that uh, uh, what you do in these situations where you are, um, where you're finding it very difficult to resist the temptation to, um, to bring home the delicious pastries, or to drop by the snack bar on your way home from work or wherever you come from uh, to get some snacks. First and foremost is the, uh, the realization that uh, you're only human. It's okay that you enjoy. Life without enjoyment is, is gray. Uh, the spirit dies. Many spiritual people, people on the spiritual path, they think they should avoid all enjoyment. The thing is, I explained before, there is this concept in yoga that is called boga, which means conscious enjoyment. And that's what you're going to do here. You allow yourself your pastries, but you come home, you put away your healthy whole wheat bread, multi-grain bread, and you enjoy your pastry. But now you pay attention to what that pastry does with you. After you've eaten, enjoyed the taste, the, the, the sight of it, because they're always very pretty, with the chocolate and the cream and what have you. But then you eat it and you notice that you crash. Especially as a yoga practitioner, you become more sensitive to things that affect your energy levels. You notice that you crash, so you think, hmm, maybe uh, I should uh, try to, uh, to avoid this, or, or at least uh, minimize this, reduce this. So you're going to play with it. You make a list of the things that you need from the bakery shop when you, next time when you go to the bakery, and you try to stick to your list. And you try to just walk away from that shop uh, with just the whole wheat bread and the products, the healthy products that you need for, for daily life, uh, sustaining daily life uh, uh, um, feeding. 
Now, when you find yourself not being able to resist, you come home with the pastry again. Or, in the case of the snack bar, with a, a, a bag full of snacks. Instead of feeling guilty, you just allow yourself to enjoy it. But you do it consciously, the boga concept, and in such way that you consciously notice that it has a certain effect on you that is not desirable. That experience and that, that realization is then the motivation to next time when you find yourself in that situation with the temptation to try to control yourself. So it's a playful approach. You allow yourself to be human. You try to really, this is really important that you avoid feeling guilty. Just use your experience to improve your ability to control next time. And the marvelous thing about this is that it might be difficult in the beginning, but there will be this moment that you are at, the, at uh, uh, the, the, the snack bar and you look inside and you see people consuming snacks that you also like very much, or you're at the bakery shop in front of that window with all those delicious pastries, and you just decide and succeed to stick to your principle, to just get what you need and go back home. And that, that, that feeling that you get then is very empowering, that feeling of control, finally succeeding. And the best way to approach this also is to, to allow yourself to enjoy something like that, a snack or a pastry, on special occasions, like Saturday evening, or uh, birthdays, or uh, oh, but for the rest of the, the week or the rest of the, the time, you notice it's there, but you know that it's not the right time to enjoy it. And as a result, you have this sense of control, and then comes the time, the moment, that you're allowed to enjoy it, and you enjoy it double, very consciously. So that is the yoga approach. But very important here is to, uh, this, this is something that uh, people struggle with most of the time, people who find it difficult to control their, their habits, consumption habits, is the sense of guilt that is very destructive. No guilt, just enjoy, but do it consciously. And from there, you will slowly but certainly gain control. So it's a little bit like the example of smoking, but then a little bit more playful. All right. That's Prachahara part two. Questions? Okay, let's have a short break.